some of the final things Jesus said before he left this planet was very simple. He said, go into all the world and take a message. Very simple message. A message that just says, tell them that I love them. This team took that message to an island in a little town. But that was made possible because of your love and your financial blessing and your prayers. So for that, I'm going to ask the whole mission team that's here to stand. And we thank you for what you've done. We wanted to give you a little glimpse of some of the things that we experienced while we were there. So I've asked uh, some of the people that went that are first time people that went on a trip, uh, they're going to come and just share a few minutes of what this missions trip was for them. So the first person I'm going to ask to come up is Christina. Make her welcome. She's very nervous. The young lady, she was the young lady who decided to be rebaptized while we was there, and because of her faithfulness, seven other, six other kids that had been saved but never was baptized came forward that weren't with us. They were just locals that were there, came out and got baptized. Um, so yeah, as Pastor John said, this is my first missions trip. Um, and I want to say off the bat, Satan really tried to get me before I got on the plane for this trip, but God had other plans for me. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I had two friends that I knew that went on this trip, so I obviously had Jeremy help me out with, you know, things to pack and what he went through on his um, other trips. But um, overall, I really, I really didn't know. Um, God really kicked me out of my comfort zone on this one, um, you know, out of the comfort zone of being in a hotel when they were usually – and run down schools on air mattresses. I really got um, the upper hand on this one. Um, so I just want to share two God moments with you guys that really that really impacted me. Um, one was our first day, um, which kind of set the mood for the rest of the trip, which was um, fantastic. Um, I was part of the med clinic, so I was taking blood pressures and um, sugars for the patients that came in. And um, one of the men that sat down in my chair um, I was taking his blood sugar, and he said to me, you remind me of my granddaughter. Um, and he said, she used to take my sugar. She's with the Lord now, but she used to do that for me. And um, that kind of hit me because um, my grandfather just recently passed away, and I used to take his blood sugars. Um, so for him to say that to me, it just kind of it kind of showed me that, that this is actually where God wanted me to be, that, you know, he would say something like that to me that hit home. And it just um, it meant a lot. So, um, yeah, the rest of the week I did med clinic. I did um, sports ministry. Um, and I love sports, so soccer's my thing. Um, yeah, they're really in shape, and I'm not. So that was not me, me Bobby, we, we, really, we really struggled in that 90-plus degree weather. That was not, that was not good. Um, but we gave them a run for their money. We loved it. We had a lot of fun with the new nets that we built for them. Um, and we just, we brought a lot of kids to Christ. It was fun. And it's, it was amazing to see that those who have nothing, absolutely nothing, glorify God every day with a smile on their face. And I, who has everything, take it for granted. So it was just a really humbling experience. I can't wait for next year. It was really nice to just see that, to meet new people, um, to be in an environment where I'm comfortable. I'm Spanish, so I understand it. Don't speak it as well, but, you know, I was, again, out of my comfort zone. It forced me to do so, and I felt, I felt better after the fact. Um, so yeah, the last thing I want to share is my baptism. I, um, I decided to do so the first day. I'd been baptized before, but obviously being baptized as a 10-year-old doesn't have the same effect as it does when you're 18 and about to go to college. Um, so yeah, I told Pastor John the first day that I was there that I wanted to be baptized, and um, I was in a river one of the last days that we were there, a very fast-moving and slimy river. But um, you know, it was nice. It was, it was cool. Um, yeah, another God moment. The best part was the two little boys. Um, I think like two days before we were at an ice cream shop and 
as we were leaving, they were outside, and um, we gave them food. Me and my roommate, Shannon, gave them two of our juice boxes and some snacks that we had, and um, we gave them some bread, and they accepted Christ. And for them to be there, you know, the same time that we were there was just, it's not chance. God put them there, and he used me and my baptism to help them. If I hadn't done it, no one would have, and, you know, it just, it, it really helped. So, yeah, I was really excited. I'm excited to go back, um, you know, with the weather and everything like that, things, little setbacks, but God has a plan, and he always follows through with his plan, so it was good to see that. Good job, honey. It's always interesting um, when we get, we see who decides to go on these trips. Uh, and, and listen, you know, $1,400 isn't a little amount of money. Um, but praise God, he, he provided with your help. Uh, but it's always an extra blessing when I see a family say that, hey, we want to go and we want to serve in this capacity together. Uh, on this trip, we had a husband and wife and two young boys um, that went and their hearts were just to serve. So I'm going to ask for Gammy and Venus and Noah and Zach to come up and they're going to share a little bit about what the trip was for them. God bless everyone. He said 10 minutes, but I can talk probably for about a couple hours with the experiences that we had. <laughs> or less than 25 words, as uh, Alex says. But um, it, was a, it was a great honor uh, being able to go out there. Um, one thing that actually stood in my mind prior to us going is, and it, what means to me is, we may decrease so that he may increase. I'm not going to preach here. Uh, I'll be like 10 minutes, like you said. But, and the second that we made that commitment to go out there, we, not even knowing, immediately decreased. Um, because we know that we're going out there for a reason, for a purpose, and that's to allow him to increase. And by us doing that, a lot of us, was 31 of us that went with us, including myself as 32, uh, probably not even knowing, we decreased and we went over there to spread the gospel, to uh, give of ourselves to those that hardly have anything. And it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, like I said, I can go on forever. The, what she had was talking about with the, uh, with the children, we saw these two kids just sitting outside, just sitting along the curb edge, 10 o'clock at night, I guess, 10.30 at night. No one around, and they were just looking around, so we gave them food. We had an opportunity to minister to them, and they gave their heart to Christ. The next day, or the very next day, when we went to the river to go uh, do the baptiz uh, baptism, it's about maybe 30 minutes away, 15 minutes away in a, in, in a bus, and it's a rocky road. It's, it's long. You, you figure 30 minutes in a car, you're probably taking maybe an hour of walking, uh, I'm assuming. So as we pull in, I see this little kid just pull up to the bus, and he looks at me, and he says in Spanish, I'll translate, he goes, I told you it was them. So, like you said, it's, God has a reason for everything. These kids walked from, for us, was 30 minutes away in a truck all the way down there to that river, and he realized it was us. So in his mind, he knew it was us because he says, I told you it was them. They followed us. They stayed there. They ate with us. And it was amazing just to be by the river and, and baptize her, and then these kids wanted to get baptized, and people just kept coming along, and they were standing by, by the edge of the river. It was just it was a, an amazing experience. And, you know, the church in the song itself, it says, um, vestido, en un alco iris, meaning that you are dressed, like your splendor is like a, a rainbow, okay? When we built that church, I, don't see, I didn't see any of the pictures, but the second we inaugurated that church, when we stepped outside, there was th these ra two rainbows. It was like bright, brighter than this light right now. It was just phenomenal, amazing. It felt like there was nothing else but these two rainbows just like, I, I mean, you, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't make this up. It, it was just amazing. Um, the, the benches that we made, we had an opportunity to, to build the benches at the pastor's house, and along comes this gentleman, and he wanted to help. So he's helping out, and we took the opportunity to pray for him. He gave his life to Jesus, and we prayed for him right there. I mean, God has a reason for everything. We're there for, 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 
for something. Um, with that being said, there were 32 of us that went out there and look what we accomplished in a week. Imagine if we doubled it or tripled it, you know, to go out there next year. Um, the things that could happen, it's just amazing. Uh, you won't regret it, I can tell you that much right now. You won't regret it. Uh, for me, it was, um, I, I'm a baby cry when I talk about the Lord. So if I start crying, sorry. Um, I stepped outside of my comfort zone with bringing my kids because my heart is missions. My husband's heart is missions, but their heart is missions too. And we've done local missions, but to take them outside of where the health care is different, if they get sick is different. Zach is a leukemia survivor, so his health is always on the back of my mind. But I knew God would cover us, and he did. And down to these two little boys, they were anointed for such a time as that, too. They um, just connected with these kids. They could have easily, or even the kids there could have easily just noticed a difference, the differences that they had and, and stayed away, but they didn't. They, they went right in, I mean, to the point where I was teaching VBS and Noah's pulling a little kid back saying, you need to come, my mom's talking, you need to listen, you know, come back to the class. So they were, they were so happy to be part of the sports ministry. They were so happy to pack their own personal little glove and ball and give that away to someone that touched them personally, someone that they connected with. And as a mom, I was just so proud and, and God reminded me, they're getting it. They're doing it. I'm, I'm with them. And um, I had so many people come up to me and tell me how amazing they were. And they didn't complain. And I just knew. I knew it was God. And I was content. And I had peace in my heart. And I also, usually Gammy's my crutch when it comes to speaking Spanish. I understand that I can tell you what they said. But speaking it's a whole different story. And it was flowing, and it was coming out. And maybe not at 100%, but we were able to get the message across, and, and I give God the glory for that. Um, just the whole trip to witness that baptism, to see what God did in everyone, there's, there's just no words. You have to experience a missions trip for yourself. Old, young, God has a purpose. God will use you. It humbles you in ways that you couldn't imagine. Sometimes you think, you know, giving stuff away or doing things here humbles you, but when you see someone with no diaper on because they can't afford it and that's normal to them, or you see um, them saving their sandwich for their family, I mean, it just takes that humbleness to a deeper, deeper level that, that you couldn't imagine. And we wanna continue to go back and we wanna continue to do this as a family. So I encourage all of you guys to, to step outside of your comfort zone and allow God to use you. Bless you. Right. And one more quick thing. I, I think I told Pastor John this, but for, for a lot of the guys that were with us when we were there, I stayed an extra week with my oh, family yeah, for vacation. Story, yeah. And, um, you know, you think you're there for, you, you did your thing, you, you were there for a week, you did the missions, and you, you think it's over, you're going to go and enjoy yourself, a little vacation. So we went out to Puerta Plata. We stayed there for a week. And like the second day, we went onto the beach, and this gentleman, of course, you know, tried to sell you things. So he gives us this little drum. He tried to get it for like $100. And I'm like, no, you know, I'm, you're not getting my money. So anyway, we stood at the beach, and then the Saturday comes around, and it felt like this guy was just like waiting for us. So he's waiting for us at the beach, and he follows us, and he's still trying to sell us his drum for $100. So we, we just said no. So we go to the beach to, lie, to, to try to get some sun, my wife and I. And he follows us, and he sits down next to us, and he just starts talking. And then he, he, I heard the word Jesus just come out of his mouth. So I took that opportunity, and we just started ministering to him. You know, so then you're thinking, we're, I'm looking at my wife, I'm like, like God, God, you're awesome. So we're, we're sitting, we're talking to him, 15, 20 minutes go by, and then my wife asked him, ask him if he's ever been baptized before. So then I just took the opportunity and asked him that. And he says, uh, no, but, you know, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. So then I said, have you ever been baptized? He said, no. I said, would you like to get baptized? So he's sitting there and thinking. He's in his work uniform. Five minutes go by, ten minutes go by, and then I see tears start going down his eyes. 
So I took the opportunity. And I said, I'll do it for you right now if you want. And he just started taking his shoes off. He rolled his pants up. And right there in vacation, we just put him in the ocean and we just baptized him. And it was an amazing experience. So you never know. You never know. Doesn't matter where you're at. Doesn't matter where you're at. And I go back to the de decrease the way he may increase. It's not about us. I know my destiny. I know where I'm going. It's not about us. Right. It's about spreading that word to other people. Amen. So with that said, God bless you all. <laughs> we can go on forever. <laughs> Uh, my favorite part was the um, sports ministry, just getting to know the kids and how they play and just getting to know them better. And you want to go back one day? Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Same. <laughs> Beautiful. Um... It's very emotional dealing with these things and um, because you're seeing firsthand, you know, what's going on in these other places. So it's a little bit challenging to uh, try to keep your composure and just kind of stick to the program. If there was something that just kept resounding on this trip was the scripture that says for such a time as this. And really that scripture is speaking about God's timing. Everything is about his timing. You can try to come up with all the different ways you want to get something accomplished. But if it's not in his timing, it won't happen. In 915, Junior shared a little bit of what his experience was. His daughter raised her money. He wanted to go. Didn't have the time at work. Then God made the time at work because he lost his job. So now he had the time, but he didn't have money. God provided for him by a person backing out and just totally donated all his money to him so he was able to go. And when he was there, while he was there, he was able to introduce his father to his 15-year-old granddaughter for the first time. And even more so, deep on his heart was that his father would come into a saving understanding of who Jesus Christ was. And he just figured, well, maybe if I get him around the work site every day, just the normal conversation, and maybe he would hear the gospel in some way. But his father couldn't come to the work site because he was working on a house himself. Then one day, he finds his father talking to Pastor Domingo. And he walks in the room, and he's watching his father bow his head and say the sinner's prayer. For such a time as this. Everywhere we set our foot, it was evident that God had been there beforehand. I remember when we got to that work site and you saw the first picture, this just stony, untouched ground. And we gathered around and we prayed. And Pastor Carlos, in his prayer, said they had been praying for six years. Six years for something like this to happen. And here we are. He was choked up. I have to tell you, it's one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had. When our full revelation came, when I realized that God was using us to answer someone else's prayer for such a time as this. The community that this new church was built in. We met a man there. He said he's been praying for years for them to bring a church much longer than even Pastor Carlos. All for such a time as this. Everything that we put our hands to do, everything that we wanted to accomplish, God had it handled. 
We wanted to set up a medical mission one day where we bring surgeons in to perform surgery. We met a guy along the way that does that for us. Every little thing God met. The bus driver we had knew everybody. I'll tell you a quick story. It's 11.15, so you ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> so <laughs> we walked into this, uh, I guess their form of Lowe's, but it like was a grocery store downstairs and upstairs. They had all this stuff. And as we walked in, you know, we had our backpacks on, and there was this pretty big guy sitting on this bench with this pistol grip shotgun. And he was like, whoa, you guys can't go. We're like, well, hey, we're missionaries. We're trying to just get some more. He wouldn't let us in. But our driver knew everybody. He walked up, said a few words. The guy just looked and said, come on. It was like that everywhere we went because God had it prepared for us to be there to begin a transformation in that community. And that's what began to happen. So, I'm going to ask you to stand up. You've been sitting a little while, and I don't want you to get too restful. You've been learning Spanish this whole service. You sang, you saw scripture. Now I'm going to teach you a little something. So I want you to turn to your neighbor, look him dead in the face, and say, Gloria a Dios. That means glory to God. Turn to your other neighbor and say, Gracias, Señor. That means thank you, Lord. That's all you need. Now you're ready to go. You may be seated. Our scripture that we're going to look at this morning is found in Isaiah 5. Now, a little bit of background on the book of Isaiah. Isaiah himself was a prophet. He lived around somewhere around 700 B.C. Now, what prophet really was in the Old Testament... God used prophets to speak because he really couldn't communicate with man one-on-one -on -one like he does today because he couldn't live inside of man because sin was present. So for uh, his purposes, he would choose specific people called prophets and he would speak his truth through them for the king and for the people of the land. So that's who Isaiah was. Now, Isaiah had a very interesting message for his people in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, he was challenging his people to repent because their ways were wicked. Remember God told them when you go into the promised land, honor my laws, honor my statutes. Well, they didn't do that. They followed other gods. They prostitu prostituted their faith. And now Isaiah was called to tell them to repent because the judgment was coming. In the midst of this whole message of repenting and judgment, there's this picture of grace. We see the pictures of the Messiah sprinkled all through Isaiah. So it's kind of interesting that you see this call to repent, change from the way you think and act, coupled with a picture of Jesus, the Messiah. Kind of how we get saved, right? We have to repent from our ways and then accept Jesus. Also, we read beautiful scriptures in the book of Isaiah, such as, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We also read, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We also see a picture of his crucifixion in the book of Isaiah. Israel, like us, needs to repent because disaster is coming if they don't change from their ways. So we're going to look at a few of these scriptures in Isaiah 5, and I'm going to kind of summarize them for the sake of time. So look at verse 8. It says, Woe, woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. What this is saying here is, is that you are so concerned with the things that you have that you just keep building bigger and bigger houses, bigger and bigger businesses, and you're swallowing up the land when really the land is for the people, not for your bigger house. Why do you need a 10-bedroom house and it's just you living alone? 
So what this scripture is saying, it's a picture of greed. Because I got to have something bigger. I got to have a bigger house. I got to spread out more. Forget about the guy that has nothing, but I just got to have more. That's greed. Woe to you, it says. Woe to you. And listen, this country is built on capitalism. And there's nothing wrong with capitalism. And listen, I don't want to live anywhere else. Maybe DR, I don't know. We're working on that. But this is a beautiful country. I served faithfully in the United States Navy. I joined during wartime. But capitalism, fueled by greed, leads to a narcissistic, cannibalistic society. And that's who we have become. We grow and grow and grow, and we consume all the resource, and then we get rid of what we think we can't eat when we've eaten to the full. Look at verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning and run after their drink, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine. Well, you know, having a party is not bad. It just means you got a good DJ. But what, it's, <laughs> what I'm talking about here is what are you chasing? What are the things that are so important to you that you get up and you want to do that right away? There was a time where I chased alcohol. I wanted to drink and party. That's all I wanted to do. I worked just enough so that I could make enough money to go out and party. That was all I wanted to do. That's what I was chasing. In my youth, I used to be able to party from Wednesday to Sunday, sleep three hours and still make it to work. What a waste of energy. Woe to me. Look at the next word, part of the verse. But they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord. No respect for the work of his hands. We have become a society that's chasing after stuff. I need more and more stuff. And really, all that does is it feeds this insatiable thirst of the flesh because the flesh cannot be satisfied. It will always want more. I don't care how much I think I have, I got to have more. It's insatiable. And the more you give it, the more it wants. That's why God's telling us to get away from looking at ourselves and think of someone else. Because when you take the thought of, off of you and you put it on someone else, it starves the flesh to die. And when the flesh dies, then you can do something for God. God has a mission for all of us. That's why he blessed us so. That's why you were born in this country. You go to a third world country and you look around and you say, Lord, why was I born here? Why was I given so much? Because you have a great responsibility with all you have. That's why it was given to you. See, in the beginning of chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, talks about that this uh, a landowner, he built this vineyard. He gave the vineyard all that it needed. He removed all the rocks, all the stony places. Why? So that when his word hit the good soil, it would grow and produce fruit. But see, when your focus isn't right, you won't produce anything. And that's what happened to this vineyard. We are blessed. We are a blessed church. We're a blessed community. And we just thank you. Because because of your blessing, you helped us be a blessing to another country. We watched God provide food for 250 people, clothed them, fed and taught children in VBS, renovated a baseball field so that children had something to do that other than drugs, sex, and, and everything else that's out there. Bought them equipment. Gave them baseballs and bats and helmets, uniforms. We get text messages every day, and they're showing us videos of these kids playing baseball again. Gathering together and praying together. Richard said this morning there's a transformation happening in this community. Eduardo Georgie said we need to build soccer goals. I said, what for? They love baseball. We built soccer goals and 50 kids showed up to play soccer. 
They got a choice. They have a choice now, something they never had before. And yes, we built a house of worship in a week. Miraculous. So on behalf of Pastors Juan Carlos and his wife, Chris Maley, Pastor Domingo Alvarez and his wife, Nidia, they wanted me to just tell you thank you from the bottom of their heart for all that you've done. The communities of Mao and Crucia de Coajacanes, hundreds of children and their parents are being blessed because of your efforts. I'm about to close, so, because I said I won't be long, but I have a story to tell you. It was Wednesday afternoon, a lady walks into the clinic with her baby. The baby was about two years old, but she looked like she was about 12 months. Her fever was super high. The baby's heart rate was over 150. It was up to about 167, a heart rate. Grossly malnutritious, and she had HIV. Alex's wife, who ran the clinic, said to me, John, we got to get this baby to the hospital. So we put, gave some money for a taxi. The taxi driver showed up, saw that the woman was Haitian, and said, listen, I can't take this lady and this baby to the hospital because she's Haitian. If I take her to the hospital, then what will happen is they'll arrest me. So we had to find another driver, another Haitian driver, to come and take her to the hospital, which we did. We said a prayer as the Bible tells us, of faith. Alex shared the gospel with that lady, and we went on back to our hotel. The next morning, we get up, we get to church, we get to the church for VBS early, and I'll tell you, I've never seen kids, 8.30 in the morning, running to a bus because they were so excited to see us. Most of those children, as you saw in the video, went to bed hungry and woke up hungry, most of them. But somehow they were there, 8.30 in the morning, ready to go. We walk in and we get word that the lady's baby died. Then we found out that this was her second baby that died of HIV because she has AIDS. And the minute that she breastfeeds, she gives the baby AIDS. So this story, this sermon doesn't have this beautiful Christian uh, 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 ending. The death of a second child. And she never responded to the gospel. In fact, she rejected it. Why? Listen to what Isaiah writes in verse 14 and 15. Therefore, death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles. Those are the, the leaders, of uh, uh, bad leaders that are making stupid decisions. And the masses, that's us who respond to it and follow it. And the brawlers and the revelers, that's me, the party guy. Then it tells us that people will be bought low and everyone humbled, and the eyes of the arrogant humbled. Here's the deal. People are dying because we are chasing the wrong stuff. Because we keep expanding our territory more and more, and we don't need it. People are literally dying. We have to ask God to transform our mind, change, repent in our thinking, so that we can begin to do and take and see what is important to God and figure out the mission for us. Listen, I understand everybody may not be able to go on a missions trip. Everybody may not be able to go and experience the things we experience. But listen, you have a mission right here in your home, in your church, in your community, on your job. You have a message of love to give. But if you're so busy, if we're so busy chasing stuff, listen, I do it all the time. I got a beautiful motorcycle that's paid off. Why do I want a bigger one? There's a brokenness in who I am. There's a brokenness in my human genome. 
that we keep fighting and going after the stuff. And God is saying, stop it. Listen, when we got there, one of the, we, we started, and I never told this part of the story yet, but we, we, my wife and I and a few others have started a nonprofit organization to do work in Dominican Republic long term. One of our visions is we want to buy a piece of land so that we can build an activity center, so we can teach vocation, we can teach uh, uh, automotive mechanics, masonry, electronics, English. These are things that they can take and get jobs. That's the things we want to do. We want to build a baseball field that give the kids another nice place to go and play. And when we were there, and I'm looking at all these opportunities, and I'm saying to myself, wow, Lord, I'm ready to do this. Well, I was ready three years ago when God blessed me and I paid off all of my debts. But because I began to chase stuff again, I found myself right back in debt again. And I was totally, totally put down. Because I'm looking, saying, if I didn't have this debt, I'd be ready to do something right now. If I had stopped chasing stuff, I'd be ready to stop the death and dying right now. So I'm not saying this to you for you. I'm telling me we've got to transform our thinking and stop it. In the next chapter of Isaiah, God calls out and says, whom will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, I will. Well, I will. I'm going to stop chasing stuff. Because there's a job for us to do, for me to do. I don't know about you, but I can only speak for myself. My wife is on board. My kids are on board. Nothing can stop us now. And I promise you, here's the deal. If we do that, if all of us begin to do that and stop chasing the stuff and put our focus on what God says is important, then the story is not over. It won't end with babies dying and moms giving AIDS to the next children. The next chapter, I promise you, will be different. It will read very differently. It will tell of people being snatched from the jaws of death. Whole families, adults, children, communities, nations proclaiming the miraculous works of Jesus Christ. That's what the next chapter will say. And you know what the final thing will be? See, I've seen the last part. The final thing is simple. The last chapter on the last page of this new story that's going to be written as we rise to meet him in the sky. Because, see, that's the hope of every Christian, right? That one day that all this hurt and all this pain and garbage that we deal with is going to go away when we go to meet him in the sky. As we do that, if we transform our thinking, you know what will happen? We're rising up to see him. And we'll look to the south. And there'll be a nation, people, thousands, rising with us. And on that day... There won't be any more language barriers because they're going to speak the same language. They're going to yell, Gloria, adios. Thank you, Father. Gracias, Señor. Glory to your name, Jesus. We will meet them in the sky to see, be with Jesus forever. My only question is this. Do you know for certain that you're going to be caught up in the sky one day? Do you know for certain that if you were to die today that you're going to go to heaven? God gave us this word, this Bible for that purpose, that we would know. Not think because I'm a good person or I've done some good things, but I would know. He said, all you have to do is put your faith in what my son did. So I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. For those of you here this morning that has never accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to ask you to say a little prayer with me right now. And it's so simple. You just say it in your own way, in your heart, in your mind, out loud, I don't care. You just say, Lord, I'm a mess. I've made a lot of mistakes. My focus has been wrong forgive me. 
I believe you sent Jesus to die for me. Come into my heart. Make me new. I commit my life to your work and to the things that are important to you from this day forward.